How good was that special music? I really enjoyed that. Jesus is all the world to me. We don't need anything more than Christ. He has accomplished everything for life and living. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have his written word. We have the words of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we have been talking about the word of God and what God has accomplished for us. Not only in sending his son to this world to die on the cross for my sins, but also equipping us with the Holy Spirit and sending the Holy Spirit into those early apostles to write down his word. Therefore, as we've been studying and looking at 2 Timothy in chapter 3, all scripture is God-breathed. And one of the things that we noticed with that is it is finished, it is done, and it gives us everything we need for life and living. Wouldn't it be nice if everything in this world, when we were done with it, it was complete? Never needing any more work. You know, we just put a new roof on this church. It gets buttoned up here this next weekend. There's a couple of little things that still need to be anchored down and finished up. But you know what? In about another 50 years, this church will need another new roof. Not many of us will be around to see it at that time. <laughs> Maybe our grandkids and great-grandkids will be doing that part, that part of it, won't they? All of our stuff is breaking down. Everything that we have is breaking down. Everything that we have is dying. It's getting old. Scripture was given to us. It is complete. And 2,000 years ago, it was good for every part of their lives. It is sufficient for our lives today. We can go back to Scripture and reapply it to our lives, not only on a yearly basis, but a monthly basis, a daily basis, an hour-by-hour -hour basis. And I'll tell you what, if you dive into Scriptures and you start studying it, there is a never-ending amount of information there that you can come across and apply to your lives hour by hour. And I'll tell you, there's times when I'll read a passage of Scripture and I know I've preached on it. And I'll think to myself, huh, what does that mean? <laughs> My brain is affected by sin and I can't remember everything I've ever read. And then sometimes people will come up to me and say, Pastor Matt, what does this passage of Scripture say? And I'll have to say, I need to go restudy that and remember what I remembered from before. <laughs> Let me get back with you on that. Scripture is sufficient. Scripture doesn't need any help. It doesn't need my help. It doesn't need your help. <laughs> In Jude, it says to earnestly contend for the once for all delivered to the saints' faith. Scripture. What was given to them? We need to contend for it. We must fight for it. We must keep it pure. We must not allow Satan to destroy it. We must not allow outside influences to come in and say, well, our culture today dictates this or dictates that, and Scripture was good for them then. It's not good for us anymore. We must earnestly contend for it. Now, I'll tell you, there have been religions over the course of time that have come and tried to do just that. Religions all over the world many times start with the Bible as its foundation, and then they add all kinds of nonsense to it. And you get different religions. Some of them don't even want to do that. Some of them write their own scriptures and write their own things. <coughs> but we have deviations from scripture all over the place. And I'll tell you today, it's hard to find people, it's hard to find churches that believe in the physical resurrection of Christ and believe in the inerrancy of Scripture and believe that even God wrote the Scripture or even believe that Jesus is God. We must now allow those things to take hold in our churches today. Therefore, earnestly contend for the faith. Our passage of Scripture before us today 
says that the word of God, the scripture, is given by inspiration of God. It is literally all it, God breathed, the whole thing. But then it goes further from there. That kind of catches you up to what we have been talking about and what we have been saying. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The thing we didn't talk about last time is what it's profitable for. Scripture is profitable, and I'm going to give you five things that it's profitable for. We've already given you one, but we're going to get on to the, the next ones, the next groups of them. And by the way, it, if you add anything to Scripture, Revelation 22 warns you against that. Don't add or subtract anything from it. God takes it seriously. And if you want to know what it is, read Revelation 22 and see what happens to the person that adds or subtracts from Scripture. You shouldn't do it. So first, what is Scripture profitable for? I'm going to tell you that first, if you go back to verse number 15, it says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. I'm going to tell you that the first thing that it's profitable for is to make you wise unto salvation. You want to know how that you can have eternal life? You want to know how you can spend eternity with God? You want to know how to get from this physical life to everlasting in the mansion that we sang about that God is preparing for us? Christ is preparing for us? You need to read scripture. It's there. Romans 10 tells us that the word of Christ is that which is necessary for salvation. We must have it. Why is it so important when I talked this morning about a couple of things just before we got into our morning message? One was the Browns work over in Indonesia to translate the word of God into people's language. Why is it so important that these mission organizations like the Legacy Thrift Shop would uh, take all the funds that they have and send out the word of God into the parts of the world where people can't uh, have it or don't have it, don't have much access to it? Literally, there's parts of the world that might have one Bible for the whole church. And I know of churches that tear the Bible apart, the one that they have, and pass it out amongst their congregation. And, and they, they, they pass their portions around to each other so they can all read different portions of it. They, they cherish it, they love it, and they've only got one Bible for the whole church. Why is it so important that we have that Bible? It is the only way to read and to know about how to spend eternity with God. Any other way doesn't work. You must read and have scripture. And that's why it's so amazing. I, I've been to some of the uh, Gideon Bible uh, they, they, uh, they have the, the Gideons will have like their little get togethers and they'll have uh, um, people get up and speak at those. And I'll tell you it's amazing to hear some of the testimonies of men and ladies that have been to the, the end of their wits, ready to commit suicide or whatever, and they find themselves in a hotel room, and there's a Gideon Bible, and they open it up and read it, and come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. Because God directs them to the right passage of Scripture. The Bible is powerful. Why? Because it's God breathed. And it's what's needed for salvation. So it makes you wise unto salvation. Secondly, in verse number 16, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. You guys know what it means to make a profit, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, the word of God is profitable for many things. It, 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 it's, it, it, it builds up and... and restores and does all kinds of things. And one of the things that it's profitable for, that it's useful for, that it's good for, is for doctrine. Now, it's not necessarily talking about the act of teaching here. It's good to teach. It's good to tear the Bible apart and learn from it. But what it's talking about here are the truths that are written down there. Everybody wants to know what truth is. What is truth? What is truth? If you want to know what's true, just turn on Fox News and you'll learn everything that's true. Or 
maybe I should say CNN or MSNBC, whatever it is, right? I'm going to tell you their truths is whatever they want to be true. And, and, and we do tend to build our own truths based off of where we come from and all those types of things. If you want to know what truth is, it's right here in Scripture. I think Paul tells Timothy earlier on in Timothy, he calls it a deposit, doesn't he? Doesn't he? He deposits the truth in us. When you read the Word of God, truth gets deposited in you. And I will tell you then, anything that this world says that contradicts Scripture is an untruth. Scripture is truth. And I know people want to take it apart and claim that the Bible has these errors in it or that errors in it, but then when they start digging into it further, they've always found out that the Bible has been accurate the whole time. <laughs> over and over again, they keep finding it out. And by the way, one, one of the reasons why mobile, I think it's mobile oil has so much oil and money is because way back, like in the 1950s, they read about Moses and read how his mom had used pitch in that little basket that they made for him. And so they went into the area and dug because the guy believed what the Bible said. And guess what he found? Oil. <laughs> mm -hmm. Scripture is truth. We already went through a lot of science with that, so we don't need to keep going through it. John 17, 17 tells us that the Bible provides us with truth. It's comprehensive. It means you can run every area of your life with it. And by the way, if you run your life based off the truth of Scripture through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all the fruits of the Spirit, all the things that the world is looking for and asking for. It's available right there in the Bible. Read it and follow what it says. You'll experience... The joy of God. You know what we should do then? We should study the Word of God. We should accumulate the principles that are there. We will build a strong foundation. And then off of that foundation, you can have every action of your life built on that sure foundation. Everything else that this world has to offer is a slippery slope and it's nothing but sand and it's moving and there's waves that come with this and waves that come with that and it's just a big mess that ends up flattening everything out and tearing everything apart. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. What's reproof? Reproof means to rebuke. It means to confront someone with a view towards convincing them of misbehavior. You know why people hate to read the Bible? Why the world hates to read the Bible? Why the world hates God and the Bible? Is because it rebukes you. Hebrews tells us that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? It pierces, it cuts. If you have never been cut by the Word of God, <laughs> you need to open it up and read it. If you've come here to church enough Sundays, you've probably been cut by the Word of God, haven't you? I don't skip over any passage of Scripture. I know there's times when I'm studying it, and it cuts me, and I say, oh. I read about pride, and I say, oh, I'm a prideful person. I read about anger, and I say, oh, I'm an angry person. I read about different things, and I struggle with different things in my own life. It cuts, and it's why the world hates it. Because it cuts and reveals. You know what it reveals? It reveals your sin. <laughs> the world hates it because it reveals their sin. Why does the world hate God? Why does the world hate Christ? Why does the world hate Christians? Because <laughs> we stand on the truths of the Word of God that come straight from the mouth of God. And it calls out sin. There's no way around it. 
And so when things are going on in our world and everybody says, oh, you need to become accepting of this and you need to become accepting of that, you need to become accepting of that. And then they read the Word of God and the Word of God says, that's a sin. <laughs> you know what they'll say about the Christian? You're intolerant. You're hateful. It's simply not true. I love those people. There are people that are struggling with sins in their lives. There are, there are people that are having issues in their lives. We need to love them. And we need to show the love of God to them. It's what's expected of the world. Is that they would be filled with sin. Where did Jesus go? And what was one of the things that Jesus was uh, condemned by the Pharisees of doing? Being with publicans and sinners. That was in our questions this morning, right? We do trivia in Sunday school. And, and by the way, when he was with the publicans, to the Jew, that was the worst of the worst. You can't get any dirtier or nastier than a publican, a tax collector. They hated them with every fiber of their being. And Jesus was found in their homes sometimes. We don't hate them. They're living in sin. That's what is expected. You know what? We have sins in our lives too. And if our sins were revealed like their sins, we would be horrified. <laughs> but that's what the Word of God does. By the way, as a believer, you should hunger for the words of God to reveal those sins to you. Then you do what 1 John 1 9 says, confess them. Then you memorize passages of scripture to help you defeat that sin. And then you're growing. You know what else reproof means? Not only to uh, show up, to show your sins but it also uh, reproves error. Anybody that comes into the church and starts bringing in false doctrines, the Word of God will show that false teaching. And if you know the words of God, you'll recognize a false teacher right away. They'll say all kinds of things where you'll be like, oh, wait a second. And by the way, if he stands up and just talks about money and that's all he's talking about, you should have some red flags going up. Because the Bible's not all about money. There's things in there about money. And we preach about it sometimes when we come across it. That's not what the Word of God is about. By the way, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20 says, When they say unto you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? You know what Isaiah says? When, when people come along and offer something different than the words of God, should they listen to those people? Should they say, oh yeah, let's, let's go to the dead people and listen to what they have to say. And there's all kinds of religions that listen to what some dead person has said, right? <laughs> you can think of a lot of religions in America that are doing nothing but listening to a dead person. Joseph Smith, Muhammad, uh, uh, Russell, all those guys have written things that they're all turning to. Should we consult them, or should we turn to the Word of God, the living God, and understand what He has written for us? By the way, the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, they were more noble because they searched the Scriptures daily. What else? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. It's number four, because we started off with it leads to salvation, right? So the fourth thing is correction. Scriptures expose error, it exposes sin, and it also has the ability to correct both things. This word, by the way, correction, is used only here in Scripture. It's the only place in all of Scripture that it's used. It means to lift you up and straighten you out. And this is highly important because if the Word of God cuts and cuts you up and exposes your sin and leaves you a mess... What do you need after that? You need to be 
built up and straightened out, don't you? You're crooked and perverse and you're leading off into all kinds of different ways and the Word of God is saying, that's a sin, that's a sin, get your life right. It exposes all of those things to you and after it exposes them things, then it sets you straight. We don't need to be turning to the left and to the right. We need to fix our eyes, fix our gaze upon Christ. Don't be headed off into all kinds of different nonsense that comes along. The, the Bible talks about that being different waves that come and pull you off and pull you to a different direction. Don't get stuck into all those doctrines and all the things that the world has to say. We don't have to be like Humpty Dumpty. You know, a lot of our nursery rhymes tell great stories. Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put them back together again, right? When, when, when the world falls and they stumble, they break into pieces and there's nothing there to put them back together again. The world offers nothing to put you back together again. All people think they do, but they don't. I can tell you they don't. I've seen it over and over and over again. You know what can set you back together again? You know who can put the pieces back together again? God can help you put those things back together again. But people love their sin, so they won't turn to it. People say, oh, I got these things I want to do first, and then I'll become a Christian. doesn't work that way. They think they want to do this, and they want to do that, and all it does is tear them apart and break them apart. The life becomes a shambles. The Word of God can put you back together again through the power of the Holy Spirit. But you must know the Lord as your personal Savior first. So that's where this all started, right? Verse 15. To make you wise into salvation. Then after that, it does all of these things. As a newborn babe desires the sincere milk of the Word, so must you. You come to know the Lord as your personal Savior, you take the milk of the word first, you build yourself up to some meat, the word of God slices you apart, takes you apart, looks at your life, you reveal all of your sin, and then it sets you straight. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God, our lives can be put back together again. And if your life has been torn apart, Lean upon God. Colossians 3.16 says, We are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Acts 20.32, The word of God will build you up. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness. So literally number five, because we start with salvation, right? Instruction, in righteousness. What is instruction? It's what you do for a child, isn't it? The Word of God helps you to mature. Helps you to grow. That's one of the reasons it's there for. Reproof is part of training. Part of building you up. And it trains you unto holiness. It trains you unto righteousness. And it leads you to righteousness, which means right living, right? It's really what it means in a nutshell. It means way more than that, but just so we can have an understanding of it, it's right living. So once it does all those things, you come to know the Lord as your Savior, you start reading it, it starts cutting into you, you start cutting those things out of your life, start building you back up again, you'll be living a righteous lifestyle doesn't mean that you're never going to sin. We have all the tools available to us to never sin again. But our flesh still gets in the way. And when our flesh yells at us, as you're growing towards righteousness, you can start saying no to it. You can begin to say no to it. God helps you do that. The Holy Spirit helps you do that. And then you know what it does? How successful is all this tearing apart and putting back together? How successful is it towards getting us towards righteousness? Verse number 17. That the man of God may 
be perfect. So, because I'm your pastor, and I've been a Christian for uh, 40 years or whatever, 45 years, whatever it is, <coughs> I'm perfect. I never sin anymore because I've got all this down. Well, that's not what it's talking about here, right? <laughs> I am not perfect. I sin, I struggle. I get angry. My pride takes over sometimes. I think I know it all. When I think I know it all, and God smacks me down many times, I find out I don't know it all. It's easy to get stuck in all those things, isn't it? What does it mean to be perfect? First of all, you have the ability to be perfect. It's one of the things it's referencing there. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God. You can die to your flesh daily. You can say no. God can help you with that. But it also means that in God's eyes, God sees you through the righteousness of Christ. And you're perfect in His eyes if you're a believer. All of your sins have been paid for by the blood of Christ. But then, because you can be perfect, because you are perfect in God's eyes, you know what all this leads to? And what you should be doing? What, what, what this, the, the, the outflow of all that cutting and building back up should be? Look at what it says there. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Good works is the outflow of everything coming in. You're not just a funnel to store everything. The Holy Spirit doesn't just come into your life and just, you know, stay there and never becomes involved with anything. The Word of God doesn't come into your life and just harbor in there and you have all this knowledge and you have all these, these things that you're working out in your life and, and, and it's just all there inside of you and, and you hide it from everybody. That's the story of the talents in the Bible, by the way, too, isn't it? <coughs> what happened to the man that buried his talents? <laughs> yeah. And they said, how dare you? That's not what it's for. You're to multiply them. When you go through this whole process, and when you know the Lord as your personal Savior, you're being built towards righteousness, you're perfect in the eyes of God, and the outflow is all good works. Not just some. Not just a little here, a little there. The outflow of your whole life should be good works. You know what good works are? Good works are anything you do in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you go off and just do something nice because it makes you feel good, it's not a good work. Now being filled with the Holy Spirit and doing a good work, I'll tell you what, that'll make you feel good. <laughs> There's no better feeling in this life, right? But doing things for personal gain or for your own personal interests or for your own building up, you receive your reward on this earth. That's what the Bible says. But when you go with the Holy Spirit, you will produce good. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will experience the fruits of the Spirit. You know what those things are? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faith, meekness, temperance. Everything the world is looking for. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this lesson that you gave to us. We thank you that you have provided this wonderful word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Father, there's nothing lacking there. It's good for every part of our life, everything that's going on inside of us. I pray that our end result will be exactly as it says here. Good works. I pray, Lord, that the world around us can look in, see who we are, understand who we are, and as they look, they'll just simply see the glory of God upon us. They'll see the Holy Spirit. 
And Father, I just ask that that would be a wonderful launching ground to present the hope that is in us. I pray, Lord, that as we all examine our own lives, we would understand what you are doing in it. And Father, I pray that as we read your word, which is how you speak to us, we'll allow those words to infiltrate our lives, to reveal who we are, and it will change us, that we will do as the Old Testament says, eat your words and make it become part of us. And then, Father, may the outflow be exactly as you have said it would be, which is good words. Lord, now I just pray that as we go out into our world, that we will be your life. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Mr. Do you have a closing Can I give a word of testimony? Sure. In 2003-2004, I had a heart problem. They misdiagnosed it, and I sat in the chair in the living room for two years. Just about two years, I can't just say exactly. In that period of time, I decided that I wanted to study the Bible. Now, I've been through Bible colleges, new tribes, the whole nine yards. And I knew it, I studied it for messages, but this was different. This was personal. And I started reading the Bible. Well, I started out 20 minutes maybe. And praying. I had nothing else to do. All I could do was look out the window. And so I started reading. And before I read, I asked God, what is it that you want to teach me in this? I'm open. Tell me what this really means. And if I had questions, I would ask God those questions. And like I said, I started out 15, 20 minutes. Well, it wound up being two and three hours. And if I asked God a question, sometimes it was almost immediate. Sometimes it was a longer period. But God answered my questions. And God showed me not just the theology, but the personal application to those things. But if we don't ask, we don't receive. And this is, an, this is an opportunity for all of us. This pastor teaches great, he tells you the truth. But that truth and the application of that truth is what's important. And you can only do that through God. He's the one that teaches you. He's the one that opens your eyes. He's the one that empowers you. That's a life-changing experience for me. I'll never forget it. It was the most exciting thing. Here I am set aside, I can't do anything, but God's talking to me. Don't miss it. Every one of us have that opportunity. But you've got to take and say, I want to know what this means. And you want to have to ask God what it means. And look for Him to teach you. Amen? Thank you. All right, number 363 of your hymnals. 363, leaning on the everlasting arms. We'll sing first and last stanza, number 363.